Good evening. Uh, my name is Paul Hedgecroft. I'm the director of the School of International Political and Strategic Studies here in the College of Asia and the Pacific. And I begin by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional land we meet and whose cultures are among the oldest continuing cultures in human history. It's my great pleasure this evening to welcome and to introduce Assistant Secretary Esther Brimmer of the U.S. Department of State. Um, her first time to, the, to Australia, as I understand. Welcome to the ANU. Uh, and we look forward to her lecture on U.S. multilateral engagement at the UN and other international organizations. We welcome as well our distinguished guests from the U.S. Embassy here in Canberra, along with other distinguished guests from the diplomatic community and, of course, the broader public. This event is co-sponsored by two occupants of this building, the Hedley Bull Center, um, our School of International Political and Strategic Studies, our IPS, as well as the Asia Pacific College of Diplomacy, represented uh, this evening by its director, Professor Bill Maley, in the back, as well as Dr. Jeremy Farrell, who will be um, uh, overseeing our question and answer this evening. I trust, Dr. Brimmer, that you will feel a special kinship to us already, uh, given that uh, she holds her DPhil uh, uh, and master's degree in international relations from Oxford University, the institution to which Professor Hedley Bull moved after leaving the ANU in 1977. I'd like to say that I missed him, but that was uh, quite a while before I moved to Australia, indeed before I ever became an academic. But we certainly uh, uh, honor uh, him uh, with this building that um, just uh, opened four years ago. Uh, since the early months of the Obama administration, uh, Dr. Bremer has held the post of Assistant Secretary of State for International Organizations. In this role, she leads the Bureau of International Organization Affairs, which advances U.S. interests through international organ organizations in areas including human rights, peacekeeping, food security, humanitarian relief, and climate change. As a compatriot, I applaud you for this role, uh, as it doesn't take a very long memory to recall a time in which the U.S. was less than wholehearted in its relationships with multilateral organizations. Prior to her appointment, Dr. Brimmer was Deputy Director and Director of Research at the Center for Transatlantic Relations at the Paul Nietzsche School of Advanced International Studies, SICE, at the John Hopkins University in Washington. Uh, there she specialized in transatlantic political and security affairs. In other words, she was an academic. And in this capacity um, was the author of a book entitled The United States, the European Union, and International Human Rights Issues, published in 2002. And she's also the editor of co or co-editor of three additional volumes, all relating to Europe and transatlantic ties. She has also held previous posts in the US Department of State and worked as well with the U.S. House of Representatives and the Carnegie Commission. Given your academic focus on Europe and transatlantic issues, Assistant Secret Secretary Brimmer, we're all the more grateful that you took the time to visit us here at the College of Asia and the Pacific. Uh, after her prepared remarks this evening, uh, Dr. Brimmer has kindly agreed to take questions from the audience. So welcome again, and floor over to you. Good evening. Uh, thank you for braving the rain and the winter weather. And thank you very much for that introduction and that warm welcome. And I, I, I especially want to send a thank you to the Australian National University for hosting me and for the hospitality I've received in Canberra uh, today. It is especially meaningful for me to be here at uh, the Headley Bowl Center. Um, as you indicated, not only did after his distinguished career here at the NU did he go to Oxford, but I had the honor of being one of his last students. In his last, as you know, he died in 1985, and in his last year when he was dying of cancer, he took four students, and we met in his house, and Mary Bowen made his tea every day, and he said, we're going to make sure that the four of you complete your degree, so it's extremely personally beautiful for me to be here. Thank you for, for, for letting me speak here. 
And it is important to our part about so much of what we do uh, do together. And so I think that it's maybe because we talked about the, the nature of the society of states, the anarchical society, the environment of things that have been so instrumental to, uh, to our thinking that's particularly important, uh, relevant that we speak here about the many challenges that the United States and Australia and other countries are, have been addressing. So I'll talk a bit uh, about uh, overall multilateral diplomacy, but let's put it in context. Let's step back and say first that the close alliance between Australia and the United States has really been the bedrock of our foreign policy issues here working in, uh, in the Asia Pacific region. And although you commented that much of my career has been working on transatlantic relations, it's a lot of it's been about how friends work together on global issues. So there's very much a con that continuity here. And uh, although uh, Canberra and Washington are 10,000 miles apart, our two countries share a closeness, given our shared values, our common language, and our commitment to human rights and democratic governance. We both see diversity and freedom as a strength. As a result, perhaps, both our countries look forward to the future through a lens of hope, not fear, and see globalization and engagement as bringing opportunity not really danger. And it, the distance has been no impediment to our cooperation in every dimension of hu human and diplomatic activity. As we often say, Americans and Australians have fought side by side from the First World War through Afghanistan. But also, our diplomats work shoulder to shoulder across the globe. We've joined forces so many times on humanitarian relief when natural or man-made disasters have struck. And whether it's space exploration or working on climate change, increasing cultural exchange, the United States and Australia are committed to one another. So as with this foundation of friendship and alliance in mind, I want to take a few minutes to talk about what I've seen as US foreign policy has unfolded uh, from our perspective at the Department of State. And then, of course, I'm happy to, to, to have a question and answer session, so I'll try to make sure we have enough time for our, for our conversation afterwards. Now, as you know, in January 2009, <coughs> President Obama took office facing serious questions about the future of US global engagement. The United States was deeply committed and involved in two long and expensive wars, which at times has strained the fabric of global cooperation <coughs> and hurt our own ability to achieve our national goals. At the same time, some fear that our traditional alliances and long outstanding commitment to international institutions risked being incapable of handling the number of difficult and complex global challenges and threats. And let's not forget that also the President inherited an economy in its worst state since the Great Depression, which generated calls in some quarters for the United States to focus inward, to turn our back on our global commitments in, a fa in favor of addressing the true challenges on the home front. I'll say what a difference three and a half years has made. As we gather together tonight, I would say few would doubt the US global leadership is back. We've not only ended the war in Iraq and begun a transition in Afghanistan, we've spent these years reinvigorating our traditional alliances and partnership, revisiting the need for better cooperation with emerging powers and re-engaging across the United Nations system with other and in other multilateral and regional organizations. The end result has been a stronger and more engaged America. And frankly, that reinvigorated US leadership couldn't come at a more important time. Our world today is more interconnected, more networked, and more complex than ever before. National economies are intertwined and interdependent. And new technology spreads information and influence to people and to more people than ever before. But at the same time, global power is more diffuse than at any time in history. Emerging centers of influence with aspirations to global leadership are bringing their own perspectives to global governance, and non-state actors are inc increasing their impact and influence. As I mentioned earlier, the strength of both our countries is found in our own domestic diversity. For the United States, and I would believe for Australia as well, we see the growing diversity of perspective on the global stage as an opportunity to strengthen the international order, and welcome the sharing of global responsibility among an increasing number of stakeholders. But they must be willing to take on the burdens that come with responsibility. So even as we face the twin forces of integ integration and diversification, our most pressing challenges have become more complex. 
and even less responsive to unilateral action. Unlike in centuries past, we are not facing a totalitarian threat. We should be thankful for that. Yet, the, uh, oh, and we're not facing the impending conflict between two major powers, yet the challenges are real. Uh, instead, as we find whether we're grappling with nonproliferation, or with terrorism issues, or climate change, or pandemic disease, or dealing with uh, challenges to freedom or to human rights, or dealing with man-made and natural disasters, these challenges and threats continue to, uh, to face the United States, Australia, and other countries, and we recognize that these types of challenges face uh, across national borders and are often beyond the capacity of one country to address alone uh, that it's often more effective to address together. Given all of this, there was ever a need for a US foreign policy anchored in a cooperative responses to shared global challenges in building coalitions for common action. This is it. As Secretary Clinton has said, we face a world in which America cannot solve alone the world's most pressing problems, nor can the world solve them without America. But although quick action averted the worst of our economic crises, and our economy is now heading in the right direction, the recovery has not been as strong as many would like. So even as the United States works to strengthen our foreign policy tools for this new era, and to address global, global crises and invest in our common future, we are not alone in facing some uh, really tighter foreign affairs and development budgets, uh, and it's a real challenge. Since 2009, the Obama administration has sought to address this multitude of challenges through a foreign policy anchored in global engagement. And in a moment, I will turn to the administration's efforts on multilateral engagement in the UN system, uh, which will, is really my area of day-to-day uh, of -day mm -hmm. responsibilities. But first, I'll take a few minutes to address a core tenet of US foreign policy in this century, <coughs> namely our increased emphasis on building a system of, for sustainable cooperation and partnership in the Pacific region. In so many ways, U.S. engagement across the Pacific has been a constant for more than half a century, as you all well know. And Australia and other close US, uh, uh, U.S. allies in the Pacific have been partners of first resort, the countries with which we share values and our commitment to global security, <coughs> and with whom we work most closely whenever we need to address a shared challenge. The same global trends I mentioned earlier, threats that are increasingly transnational, changing geopolitical balances are clearly apparent in the Pacific region. And to address these challenges, the United States is working with Australia and other Pacific nations to build the sort of regional architecture and cooperation that's proven so effective out in other regions. We're strengthening our bilateral security alliances, deepening our relationships with emerging powers, engaging in regional organizations for, such as ASEAN, expanding our trade and investment, building a broad-based military presence, and advancing human rights and democracy. <coughs> and to do all this, we're investing diplomatically. As you know, Secretary Clinton uh, broke out with convention when she made her first official trip abroad to Asia. President Obama was the first US president to attend the East Asia Summit last year in Indonesia, discussing the importance of cooperation to addressing political and security challenges, as well as opportunities to improve uh, improving regional capacity for humanitarian response, and as you know, we hosted the APEC Forum last year in Honolulu, where leaders from both sides of the Pacific committed to measures that will increase economic growth and job creation, expanding trade and investment in the Asia Pacific region. So when President Obama was in Australia last year, he reiterated that with the war in Iraq ending, the Iraq Afghanistan commitment winding down, the United States was looking toward the future that we needed to build, and in doing so, looking towards the Asia Pacific region. And although we will still need to build this shoulder to shoulder with our closest allies in the region, including Australia, we do not aim to exclude any country, nor to create any undue fissures. The United States has spent the past three years working to build a cooperative relationship with a variety of countries, including China, and we'll continue to do so in the years to come. Every Pacific nation has a stake, a secure, peaceful region, where rules and rights are respected. And every Pacific nation will benefit from regional architecture that promotes our common goals. Now what we're seeing in the Pacific region is also true internationally and globally as well. As the one international organization with a global mandate and scope, the United Nations remains central to confronting the shared challenges we face. 
and U.S. engagement at the U.N. has been one of the cornerstones of this administration's foreign policy. In 39 short months, we've come a long way reversing years of neglect, indifference, and zero-sum international politics, instead engaging in the painstaking, time-consuming diplomacy needed to mobilize the international community and to take effective action to address our shared threats and challenges. Australia and many Pacific nations have been among our closest partners in addressing the uh, global issues of shared concern. So let's turn to some of the particular issues on the agenda. No doubt, perhaps, the ongoing violence may be very much uh, on your minds about the situation in Syria. For more than a year now, the United States and our partners have worked <coughs> to try to find a peaceful solution to the crisis. The Assad regime continues its unconscionable assault on the Syrian people. For now, Russia and China continue to protect Assad and defy the overwhelming majority of the Security Council and the broader international community, who by contrast have stood with the Syrian people in their time of need. Even as the United States works with partners across the globe to increase pressure on the regime, we will continue to provide humanitarian assistance to the Syrian people, to enhance the capacity of Syrian and international organizations to document human rights violations being committed, and to provide the opposition with communications equipment and other forms of non-lethal assistance and direct financial assistance. We continue to believe that political transition in Syria, led by the Syrian people and supported by the international community, is the best path for <coughs> Syria's future. But even as we continue to seek solutions to the crisis in Syria, it's worth recalling the number of successes we've achieved in just a few short years. A top U.S. priority for this administration has been our work with partners the world over to combat the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Over the past three years, we've worked to garner support in the U.N. Security Council for unprecedented sanctions against Iran and North Korea for their nuclear programs. And President Obama has carried forward his Prague vision and his personal commitment to a world without nuclear weapons. He was the first U.S. President to chair a session of the United Nations Security Council, and at that, that session, a, a resolution was adopted that unanimously underlined the support for the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and the role of the International Atomic Energy Agency and the importance of reducing nuclear weapons. And the President has operationalized this commitment through extensive support the U.S. has provided to U.N. efforts to improve state capacity for preventing nuclear proliferation. Over the past three years, U.S. leadership at the U.N. has also been essential to a number of, of cases of effective international action to protect civilians and to prevent armed conflict. In Libya, quick action by the Security Council saved countless lives. And today, the international community is working with the U.N. to help Libyans build a prosperous and stable future that respects their rights and reflects their aspirations. U.S. multilateral leadership and broad coalitions have also been key to addressing other crises, and, for example, trying to prevent the return to open war between Sudan and South Sudan. The United States has worked hand in glove with the U.N. to facilitate its rapid response to the devastating 2010 earthquake in Haiti, and the U.N. has been central to the international community's efforts to stabilize Somalia and reduce the country's destabilizing exports of terrorism, piracy, extreme poverty, and migration. <coughs> Well, as you well know, that one of the more hallmarks of UN action has been the United Nations peacekeeping efforts. And UN peacekeepers, whether military, police, or civilians, are increasingly taking on complex, difficult mandates to protect civilians and promote stability in places like the Democratic Republic of Congo, Cote d'Ivoire, <coughs> Darfur, and Lebanon. We send UN peacekeepers, 120,000 of them are deployed right now to many of the world's most persistent and dangerous conflicts, where, there are frequent, where there's frequently little peace to keep, where the challenges are too thorny and deep for any one state to fix single-handedly. Their task is not simply to restore order, but also to help build the conditions that will support and sustain peace over the long term. We've worked closely with Australia and the United Nations to promote understanding and acceptance of the importance of civilian security and democratic, reliable state institutions to restoring and maintaining stability. And of course, you know firsthand the challenges and the need for UN peacekeeping. 
Ever since 1947, when Australians were part of the UN's first group of military observers, your forces have deployed as UN peacekeepers and in some of the UN's toughest missions. Now, peacekeeping missions are not the UN's only field deployments making a difference these days. The United Nations political missions <coughs> are working in dozens of post-conflict settings, trying to prevent the return to armed conflict and the untold cost that brings both in both economically in terms of human lives. And UN civilian missions are bringing critical state-building expertise to fragile governments and often help mediate and diffuse political conflicts so they do not prompt a return to arms, and including in places such like Iraq and Afghanistan, but many other places as well. And these are places where UN missions are important partners for the United States and our other allies. In each of these locales, multi-level action has been the key to the global response. And although many of these challenges persist, it's almost impossible to imagine how more insecure we would be without action through the UN system. Now, our engagement at the United Nations has not only been in pursuit of international action on pressing threats to international peace and security. The multilateral diplomacy has been an important part of efforts by the United States and our partners to promote universal human rights and to advance shared values. When the Obama administration took office in 2009, few parts of the UN system were as in need of change as the United Nations Human Rights Council. For three years following the creation of the HRC in 2006, the United States sat on the sidelines. As a, as a result, had little influence to prevent the HRC from sliding into a body that spent more time criticizing Israel than all it did all of all other countries combined. By 2009, this administration ran, uh, ran and won a seat on the Human Rights Council so that it could seek to improve the council from within. <coughs> and the short time since then, US leadership at the Human Rights Council working in close collaboration with partners from all corners of the globe has resulted in a transformation of that body into one that now regularly responds to pressing human rights situations with timely, concrete action. In just this short period, US leadership at the Human Rights Council, working with our partners, has led to a series of important advances for the protection of human rights worldwide. From launching commissions of inquiry to investigate human rights violations in Syria, Libya, and Cote d'Ivoire, to the establishment of the first ever Special Rapporteur on Human Rights on Abuses in Iran. The HRC has worked to shine a global spotlight on persistent violators of universal human rights. And passing the first ever resolution uh, in the UN system establishing rights for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people, and saying that rights are in fact human rights, is a, and having a broad cross-regional group of HRC members took a historic step in ensuring that the rights enshrined in the Universal Declaration are protected for all men and women, regardless of their sexual orientation. And since 2009, the United States and our partners on the Human Rights Council have expanded the international mechanisms to monitor and protect core human rights, including freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, and the rights, uh, rights of women to live without discrimination. None of this has been easy, and the work is not done, which is why the United States is running for a second term on the Human Rights Council this autumn. But Americans, like Australians, believe that these universal rights are the birthright of every man, woman, and child, and no matter their nationality. And we know that the suppression of these rights is not only a consequence of armed conflict, but can be the cause of armed conflict as well. I've walked briefly through several of the challenges in the peace and security and human rights realms where the Obama administration has worked multilaterally through the UN system to promote effective international action. But I want to take a moment to highlight the important transition that's coming up regarding how the international community organizes to improve human well-being through economic development. For 12 years, we've been working through the framework known as the Millennium Development Goals, or the MDGs which set targets for dramatically <coughs> reducing poverty by 2015. Now, much real, measurable progress has been achieved in that time. Extreme poverty has been reduced by half, five years ahead of the 2015 deadline. And we've reduced by half the proportion of people lacking dependable access to clean drinking water. And there have been remarkable improvements to more than, for more than 200 million people who live in slums. These are huge, 
huge advances in human well-being the world over. And they wouldn't be possible without the kind of international engagement and cooperation I've been discussing tonight. Yet there remains much work to be done in the next three years on the other MDGs, and the international community is also already discussing the follow-on efforts, the post-2015 period, and how to continue these efforts. But the very real achievements made are, are another example of why the Obama administration placed such an emphasis on global engagement, because we recognize the complexity of so many contemporary problems that are too difficult to tackle alone. Over the long term, sustaining these and other efforts to mobilize common international response requires serious attention to the fabric of global cooperation. While we agree with the emerging powers who state that the international order must be renovated to better, better reflect the contemporary landscape, we also know that in too many ways the UN's operations remain stuck in the last century. In this vein, the United States has gone to great lengths to build a more sustainable, just, and effective international order, including working to improve UN effectiveness and operations where it counts. We've spent years in close partnership with UN leadership and a number of countries, including Australia, to increase transparency, oversight, and accountability for results across the UN system. And as a result, we've seen real, tangible improvements at the UN in New York, as well as with the various funds, programs, and agencies that comprise the broader UN family. And importantly, for the long-term stability we've made clear over the past three years, that our UN reform efforts are driven by a shared understanding, namely that we need the UN to adapt to the 21st century if it's to <coughs> continue to bear the weight that we increasingly are putting on it. I hope tonight I've given you not only some insights into how the United States has approached these remarkable changes that are defining the 21st century world, but also shared some of the thinking behind all the attention we've been paying to Asia and Asia Pacific region. And there are also so many issues that I haven't touched on, and hopefully we'll have a touch be able to discuss in the question and answer session. As I was said, we're, we're lucky to be living in remarkable times and with just a little perspective. I think it's accurate to say that we're witnessing some of the, uh, some of the trends that may be long-term ones for, for the century ahead. For our part, the Obama administration has sought to uh, address these tumultuous times by forging conditions for effective multilateral action and international cooperation by reinforcing the global and regional architecture to better stand the tests we know it will face. And with that, let me conclude my remarks. Again, thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening, and I look forward to our conversation in the question and answer session. Thank you. Secretary Rima for that, uh, that tour of very impressive breadth and depth of uh, the extent of US engagement uh, globally, going from Australia through our region uh, to the Middle East and around the world and through the United Nations. I am uh, Jeremy Farrell from the Asian Pacific College of Diplomacy. It's my great pleasure to uh, moderate this Q&A session. And uh, it's, it's wonderful that uh, our presenter has presented such a depth of ideas in such a brief space, so we actually have quite a bit of time for questions and answers, which is absolutely terrific. Uh, so we have about 20 minutes before refreshments will begin in the foyer. Uh, perhaps we might take questions in clusters, so if, if we could have perhaps three questions uh, to start the ball rolling, please, uh, don't be shy. Yes? Um, uh, you briefly mentioned... Yes, uh, if, if, if you could just state your name and uh, uh, organisation. Sure. Sure. Um, I'm Garen Schmidt and um, I'm doing a Bachelor of, um, Bachelor of Arts here at a &E. um, And I, you briefly mentioned um, um, China and um, the engagement, uh, multilateral engagement that the um, US and Australia have, have been um, engaging with China on. Um, I was wondering, specifically in relation to the um, Sanchuko um, incident between Japan, Korea, and China, um, what uh, what stance can you see America taking um, in trying to deal with that situation in a multilateral way? Thank you. Shall I go ahead and answer, or, 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 or do you want me to take? Uh, perhaps we can. Okay, sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, first up, to, to say that 
as I indicated, that we think that an increasing role for China internationally is very much a welcome one. As I say, for, for states to take on more responsibility in supporting the system, we think is actually, actually a good thing. The question is how to build the right network of, uh, of international organizations that are part to help sustain values as, as, as within the region and globally on, on that issue in particular. Uh, on, the, on the particular uh, issue of the challenge, we think it's important that the countries themselves work with each other diplomatically to, to resolve that situation. We think that it's the diplomatic uh, tools that need to be, to be dealt with, and we think the direct conversation between the three are the most effective in dealing with that, doing that scenario. But as I said also in my comments, that we think the overall, in terms of uh, creating regional architecture, that all countries, irrespective of size, should have, have an active role in, uh, in, in the regional structures and have their voices heard. Three questions, uh, gentlemen. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Brimmer, just uh, with a, uh, you mentioned the. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Alex Edwards from the uh, University of New South Wales. Um, you mentioned um, the requirement to uh, reform the United Nations and bring it into the 21st century. Um, just sort of pairing that with uh, the recent events in Syria and the fact that the Security Council has basically been unable to act given the actions of Russia and China, and so on. Um, just on the base of that, um, do you feel, or your personal perspective and the US perspective, uh, that it's time to perhaps uh, change and reinvigorate the Security Council as it stands, given that it's still basically in the power paradigm of 1945, with the veto powers as they stand? Uh, do you think it's about time that, that changed? Well, as the President has been very clear, the United States does support a <coughs> modest increase in the permanent membership of the Security Council. We think it is a central institution for international peace and security. We think it's a, set, a central institution now. Uh, but we also want to be sure that it retains its effectiveness. And therefore, we stress a modest increase. We also note that, as you know, there's only been one charter change to the uh, structure of the Security Council, increasing the numbers to 15. So it's not something we take lightly. And so we think it's serious that uh, as all member states, and obviously any change of the charter would have to be voted on by all member states, and we have to think about whatever reforms that might be made to it, uh, and ever whatever modest expansion would have to be sustainable for decades to, uh, decades, uh, to come. So therefore, we also think it's important that uh, whatever uh, increase there might be to the Security Council would be to states in their national capacity. We do not see a role for regional seats. We think that, that, that countries take on the responsibilities of being a member of the Security Council, whether permanent or non-permanent, um, because of their commitment to inter international peace and security. So we do see that there's space for that. The President has, has talked about that in particular. We do not see a case for a change in the status of the veto. <coughs> yeah, I'm, I'm Jason Lamchek, and uh, I'm a student here as, as well, P a PhD student at the School of Humanities. Um, my, my question is uh, regarding multilateralism it seems that uh, many of the critiques focus on the concept of uh, uh, focus on the issue of international justice particularly the perception that the previous administration not only did not uh, take seriously uh, international justice but actually committed international crimes in Afghanistan for example or in Iraq and uh, it's still a big thing that the U.S. is not part, for example, of the International Criminal Court. And, uh, <coughs> and so you have people like Julian Assange trying to you know, uh, uh, mobilize uh, uh, the world to, to, be aware, to, be, to be more, to be aware of uh, this continuing <coughs> uh, position of the United States uh, that that somehow immune from international justice. So I wonder if you have, uh, if if you think, uh, to be for for this administration, for the Obama administration, to be taken seriously in its uh, <coughs> rhetoric that it's again taking multilateral multilateralism seriously, that uh, it needs to be part of international justice. Thank you. I guess. Perhaps we might take okay. a few questions. Okay, so um, I wondered how long it might take for Julian Assange to yeah. rear his head in this forum. We had one question over here and then another one. Okay. Um, Alexander Mack, um, Director of Studies in International Affairs. Ambassador, um, which of Asia, Asia institutions do you feel is best able to manage some, some of the wicked problems which, 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 which for example, Southeast Asia faces? Is the ASEAN Regional Forum equipped to, to, hand, hand, to, 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 hand, 
to, to hand, handle the competing claims in the South China Sea. Is the ASEAN framework itself, can ASEAN can, can, itself be, 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 be trusted to be to, 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 to best manage? To just manage this. And then final question. Is it true that the Secretary Sorry, of State, oh, Raj Singh, I'm a student of Commerce, is it true <coughs> that, that, that the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, is, will be addressing South Pacific Forum leaders in Rarotonga in you know, a week's time? And if so, uh, there is a very high level delegation, I think. Uh, addressing the South Pacific Forum, does it have anything to do with the rise of Chinese influence in the Pacific? Okay, thank you. Very many questions. But we'll turn to, to unpack each, each, set, each set of our, our, our questions. Um, first off, let, uh, let me unpack your question. You actually, I think, conflated three completely separate issues. So let's unpack them and we'll look at them code for the first one. The first was the question of uh, the uh, Conduct, I think you're probably particularly thinking about the conduct toward uh, people who are held as prisoners. And I think you should note that, of course, that President Obama very clearly in his 2009 speech at the National Archives talked about um, the U.S. recommitment to not use torture and the mistake of using waterboarding. He was very clear and made it very clear the United States would no longer uh, conduct such activities. A clear break with previous practice and a clear uh, statement by the President which has been implemented. I think that's important to notice. The second thing you talked about was the International Criminal Court. The United States is an observer, not a member of the International Criminal Court. As you know, in our system, that you have uh, that uh, that um, that in order to uh, to accede to any treaty, we have both a uh, both an extensive diplomatic process and a, a uh, executive and legislative uh, process. So we're not uh, now taking on the issue of whether the, the United States deserves to become a member of the ICC. But as observers, we're very active observers, and uh, and under this administration, the United States has been an active member uh, and participant at the states' parties. As you know, when the states' parties meet, that observers also have an opportunity to speak and be involved. And we've sent high-level delegations. My colleague, Harold Coe, who you will know is the dean of Yale Law School and on leave uh, as the legal advisor uh, in the Department of State, leads our delegation, usually accompanied by Ambassador Steve Brown, who's our ambassador for war crimes. And we send a high-level expert delegation to participate as active observers um, at the International uh, Criminal Court in a way that is appropriate as an observer. Um, we're also, in, when appropriate on a case-by-case -case, uh, uh, basis, been willing on the Security Council to vote for resolutions that talk about the International Criminal Court, again, in a way that is, uh, uh, we think is appropriate. So I think it's important to notice those really important uh, changes in approach that are taken by this administration. The third thing is you raise the, the issue of Mr. Assange, and I think that you mischaracterize his participation. I think we have to differentiate a couple of things. There's the current flurry in the news issue about his extradition issues. That's not an issue for the United States, it's an issue between the countries that involved. But the underlying issue uh, really has to do with the unauthorized leak of classified material. And that is something that we condemn, as I think everyone here should, because what is the role of classified material? Usually to protect, for example, human rights defenders. I talked about the important role of advancing freedom of expression and advancing uh, press freedom and advancing human rights. What's well, often those people who are most courageous who come forward talking about what's happening in their countries, they come and conference to countries who they think will advance efforts of human <coughs> rights. It's those people who are put in danger by efforts by uh, on the, on such unauthorized links. I think that also um, that the uh, uh, the efforts on arms control, uh, on non-proliferation, and others um, are important issues, and those who seek to profit from uh, such uh, such activities also, I think, uh, do the international community a disservice. Now let's turn to the second set of questions, the, uh, the ASEAN uh, Regional Forum. And that here, again, uh, one question, of course, uh, international organizations ultimately can only do what their member states really want them to do. And so the question is also uh, to what extent, what weight we're willing to put behind it. But we think there have been important developments with that within the, uh, the ASEAN community. For example, just go back to human rights. The creation of a, of a commission that's trying to look at some of these issues, that's an important development. I think we'll continue to have to work to try to foster connections between regional efforts and making sure we retain support for the global universality of human rights and don't lose track of that in terms of focus of research. But we think there's a lot of potential there. We'll continue to have to work on a very, very, con a very concrete uh, 
uh, uh, measures. Um, and then the question of the Pacific Island Forum. Well, while the Secretary's schedule itself has not yet been confirmed, I'll say that indeed the United States has been very active both in the Pacific Island Forum as an observer and along with other, uh, other uh, organizations in the region, as we have with in other regions as well. Obviously, most visible here has been the, the activity of whether it's the Pacific Island Forum, where we think it's a good opportunity to talk both to the Pacific Island states, with whom we work on so many uh, issues across the, uh, the UN system. Also, whether we're talking about climate change, sustainable development, these are important issues in the region, and we want to be present as active observers. We're also active in a variety of other organizations. I mentioned these days, Summit, um, and others where we're taking a more advanced role. And if we look at other regions in the world, we're also going to more conferences, becoming more active. That's part of multilateral policy, attending more sessions, and so that we're doing that in, in all regions and hoping to make a more, more positive and sustained commitment to, uh, to multilateral organizations. Any more questions? One at the front, mm -hmm. in the middle, and then over at the side. Hi, uh, my name is Ben Shear. I work uh, in the Infrastructure Division at the Department of Climate Change and Energy Efficiency. So as you imagine, my question is related to the role of metropolitan structuralism in addressing climate change. Um, as you know, we've had um, the negotiations for the past 20 years or so, uh, a bit more now, and we've had a couple of um, false starts, you could say. We've had the Kyoto Protocol, and we've had uh, the Bali Roadmap that led to the negotiations in, in Cancun, of course. <coughs> and yet, in both of those cases, those processes have failed to lead to what could be uh, characterized as a, a durable, um, and effective regime, international regime to, to address climate change. Um, but in Durban, what has been held as a breakthrough is a new agreement to negotiate a new agreement. Um, and uh, that agreement would come in, would be agreed by 2015 to come into place after 2020. Um, my question is essentially, um, what do you think um, can be done differently this time? And, and how can we make this time work? How can we get it right the third time around? My name's Robert Floyd. I'm from the Australian Safeguards and Non-Proliferation Office. My question is around what does the future look like, Assistant Secretary, in terms of multilateralism in a world which is increasingly globalised, but at the same time has greater expression of regionalisation. So what is the opportunity and the hazard of globalisation and regionalisation working together? And finally, up. This is Swarna. I'm an international student here at the AIM. I have two short questions. Uh, firstly, do you think there is a case for reducing financial aid to Pakistan and in order to uh, slow down the spread of uh, terrorism? Because clearly nothing seems to be happening and, um, and nobody really knows where the money is going. And uh, part two is, uh, do you think there is a case for pressurizing Bangladesh? Uh, in their treatment of Muhammad Yunus, the, the very well-known economist, well, and, and of course a Nobel laureate, because that could pressurize, uh, that could create a mechanism to eliminate poverty at, even at a faster rate, because Muhammad Yunus has clearly played a very great role in reducing poverty, not just in Bangladesh, but in uh, many places around the world. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I was uh, uh, take uh, both. We both talk about climate change, then talking about the future, and then talking about Pakistan and and, and Bangladesh. That um, it, indeed uh, the I think there has been important uh, evolution in the discussion, the, the multilateral conversation about uh, about climate change. Um, do we uh, do we think that there's a more that we'd like to do? Yes, clearly. You know, we, we hope that this uh, that this this round will lay and, and enable us to uh, to accomplish our longer term our longer term goals of addressing climate change. But I will say that one of the important thing is now is at least we're having one global conversation. And that wasn't the case um, uh, four or five, six, ten, or ten years, ten years ago. That were actually, whether it's the major economies, whether it's the, the countries who already signed up to previous uh, uh, judge groups, at least we're having one conversation to try to come with a global way. That is an important, uh, important uh, development. Um, I think also that uh, that we that whatever uh, country's economic uh, levels that they have an important role to play as part of uh, part of the, uh, the uh, effort on climate change. I think it's also important that the the, the International levels also help to drive some of our choices in terms of national support um, for our uh, trying to mitigate the effects of, of climate change. But yes, there's going to be a lot more to do, and I think it's going to still be difficult negotiations because of the profound 
change is required from a variety of economies, not just my own, but from many economies of the countries sitting around us, sitting around that uh, uh, around that uh, that table. That means take a lot. Of, uh, I think a lot of a lot of diligence in the years comes as you identify this. These are some of the most profound questions about economic development, social inclusion. Um, but the fact that we're having one single conversation, we think, is at least a, 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 a part of the of the uh, of the forward. Um, looking at what does the future look like um, in terms of multilateral, that is a huge question, <laughs> you know, and one is uh, always got uh, cautious about trying to uh, predict. Um, so I would just suggest maybe just some 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 things to to look at. Um, greater integration, greater economic integration, then requires our societies to be much closer together. That the uh, well, we've always talked about the importance of, of, of adhering to many standards uh, domestically. That's even more more the uh, more the case now as our society, as our societies run into each uh, each other in a much more close fashion because of the deeper economic integration. We think, therefore, that some of the time honored principles, such as commitment to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, are actually even more important than they and they ever were and they ever were before. And trying to support those mechanisms that help are even more important. That's why these things like the Universal Periodic Review, which is a new mechanism which requires all of us um, who are members of the United Nations um, to have our human rights reviewed and our, our adherence to that single document reviewed, and we all comment on each other, uh, is really important. Those are the sorts of mechanisms we think will actually persist and are part of actual uh, efforts to try to uh, improve human rights in service of countries, because it's not just the three hours you sit in Geneva having other countries comment, it's a process you go to get there. The national dialogue that has to happen in countries with civil society, with non-government organizations, in order to present that, those are sort of things we actually think are, are part of are part of helpful uh, in terms of, uh, of helping out and increase uh, standards. We also think that um, if you look at there's an important role for regional organizations, depending on how uh, what they choose to, can actually sometimes help their member states meet their global commitments. Maybe providing advice, technical support on ways to meet the commitments we think is important as well. And the, the, the traditional role played by international organizations of setting norms and helping states meet them is something that will continue and persist everything from aviation standards all the way through to, uh, to, to human rights service. And those structures will continue to be important, important service performed by international or, uh, organizations and, uh, and uh, supported by, by robust multilateral engagement. Uh, and then you asked me a question particularly about, about uh, Pakistan and, and Bangladesh. Now, I admit I'm not a specialist in South, uh, South, South Asia, um, but I will say that, that, that the, <coughs> the important uh, bilateral conversation um, on addressing um, extremism on, on all sides of the border around Pakistan remains an important conversation now. We continue, we continue to have our, 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 our engagement with Pakistan and with Afghanistan as well. Uh, as well. Um, and your question, particularly about uh, the treatment of uh, Mohammed Yunus in, in Bangladesh, we of course always, always are, are interested in the uh, particular treatment of, of such uh, leaders on the international stage, and particularly note the huge role the microcredit has played play in so many parts of the world. The model, of course, has been important in many other places, and we continue to think it's extremely important. Indeed, it's then inspired many other programs, both bilaterally um, and in other contexts, to try to say how can uh, more creative use of targeted funds and targeted monies in small amounts actually be useful. So it's really been a revolution in thinking and so of salute that contribution to think about international development issues. We have time for just three more questions. Start with these two in the middle, and then this <coughs> here. Yes. I'm Melda from the Red Authority Institutions Network. Uh, you mentioned something about the leadership role of the United States in, in terms of revitalizing uh, international human rights mechanism in the form of the Human Rights Council. Um, my question is, how would this leadership role, uh, how would uh, it operationalize its leadership role in terms of moving from the peer pressure uh, to uh, actual implementation or seriously implementing the recommendations of uh, countries in the uh, Human Rights uh, Council and whether that would it mean that the United States would take the lead role in, in fact implementing uh, the recommendations <coughs> proposed by other countries to the United States. And my second question is how, does, uh, how would you respond to the criticism about uh, uh, this, uh, being uh, 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 about uh, uh, countries being uh, uh, more focused on Africa in terms of persecuting uh, human rights violations rather than um, looking at other countries, for example, allies of the US or other countries in Asia who are doing um, equally uh, massive human rights violations. Right. I, in particular, in that last part, you're talking particularly about uh, uh, issues on the agenda of the Human Rights Council? 
Uh, it's in general that right. the, okay. in terms is particularly on, on intervention in Africa okay. and uh, Okay, let me take this. Okay, okay um, and other, uh, I'm not sure if I can. Actually, no, no, please, 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 I'm not sure if I can. Okay, yes. <laughs> my name is Elfira and I'm doing my Master's in International Relations. And I'm, uh, I'm going to touch on the issue of hu human rights, especially in West Papua, because I come from West Papua, Indonesia. And when Obama came to, uh, President Obama came to Indonesia, and he uh, talked just about the last show big calls on West Papua issue. But then uh, we see that there's paradox there because the uh, the problem is uh, the torture and human rights ab abuses there is conducted by states. And when the international advocates, uh, international human rights advocates, they want to come and cover it, these issues actually are banned by the Indonesian government by saying it's our sovereignty. So my question would be, what do you think the effective mechanism um, to handle this kind of situation? Because these people have to claim their rights and they will claim to whom, that's the big question. Thank you. <coughs> Um, my name is Ronald Vargas, I work in the Australian Parliament. Uh, my question is around the Indian Ocean, an area which has not been discussed very much, uh, and just has been discussed at John Hopkins and other universities as well in the US. Uh, my question is around how does, he, how does the, view, the US view the Indian Ocean, particularly when the Indian uh, Navy is one of the biggest navies there at the moment, and how is it responding to the situation in Burma? as well as a growing maritime uh, trade, as well as energy security trade in that part of the world. I'll try, I'll try to answer, I, I, I apologize for being brief, and so that each one of these will be a whole seminar, so I, 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 I unfortunately probably a little abbreviated my response, but I want to I get to all, all, all three questions. Um, uh, particularly looking at the, uh, on the uh, International Human Rights Council, and I was talking about um, reinvigorating the Human Rights Council, I talked about both the role of the United States and working with other partners um, to, to try to make the Human Rights Council to bring onto the agenda of the council issues that are pressing and to try to make it more responsive and more agile, a more agile body. And so I think that it's important to, to notice that um, not only was the US willing to raise issues within the uh, Human Rights Council, but increasingly encouraging other states that care about an issue to raise it in the Human Rights Council. So for example, the meeting on the Cote d'Ivoire was actually brought by the Africa Group. Because the Africa group said uh, after the presidential election when there was not a transition of power despite the, the, the votes of the Ivorian people, it was the Africa group said, wait a minute, we care about this issue, why can't we have a special sanction on something we care about? That was an important, important <coughs> development uh, uh, within, the, uh, within the Human Rights Council. Um, we think also that the, uh, the, the process of the, of the UPR, you asked us about, uh, about the, the response to the UPR, we take very seriously all of the recommendations that were made uh, in our three-hour sessions, you know, both in the session itself and afterwards, countries can comment. I think we received, I think, 280, 290 different, uh, different uh, specific comments. Not only did we then have an interagency process to take, to review each of the recommendations, that as you know, several months after, the, at the next session after you've had a universal periodic review, you respond, and, and our, uh, my colleague I mentioned before, Howard, Howard Cohen, big fan of Howard Cohen, so he's a legal advisor, actually fabulous to work with, and he led the team that went back to respond to the recommendations from the UPR. We take very seriously, as I say, the process before UPR itself and the, and the follow-up as well, and we encourage many other states to hopefully to, to, to do the same. But then your, your point also about, uh, about uh, issues on the agenda, um, and I was to say that, that actually both at the Human Rights Council, whether it was addressing the challenges in Sri Lanka, Syria, Libya, all of them, there have either been resolutions or special sessions in the Human Rights Council on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a whole range of issues, so it's not so solely issues in the Africa region. Do you mean issues on the Security Council? Is that what we, uh, in, in thinking about the, the question? I will say that many, uh, that the, uh, the majority of peacekeeping operations um, uh, uh, staged by the Security Council, a large number are in Sub-Saharan uh, sub Africa. Um, and in many cases, because that's supposed to, in many cases, to be a, a support for the international community, for the efforts by people in the country and, and themselves to look at the largest peacekeeping operation is in the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, MINUSCO. That is, uh, what is because of the complex mixture of security situations where it's seen as a contribution to hopefully help the Congolese make their, their choices. 
And if we look at, for example, Sudan and South Sudan, there again, where you see the, uh, both the, the birth of uh, the new country, South Sudan, it was because it was on the Security Council agenda and the effort to implement the Comprehensive Peace Agreement after 20 years of horrific civil war. That was on the, uh, the yes, it was on the Security Council agenda. I think it was seen as a positive contribution, from the, especially from the Southern Sudanese people, that it was actually remained on the Security Council agenda. And often we get the reverse problem of being saying, why isn't an issue on the Security Council agenda? Rather, as in, why isn't the Security Council about to kind of taking on more rather, rather than, uh, than, <coughs> than less? Uh, to take up uh, the question, let's see, um, of uh, I think NGOs and the ability to participate in, 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 in sessions, and you talk about the interest of, of, uh, of uh, I believe I if I understood your question, in terms of, of uh, uh, civil society and just be able to go and comment on the indigenous or any other government on uh, being able to be part of the participation. Is that your, your, your question? Indeed, and the United States has been a strong supporter in having non-governmental organizations be able to be heard in the UN system. We, uh, we are ready to speak out in the, uh, uh, the, the committees that, um, that provide um, accreditation um, for uh, NGOs to try to encourage NGOs to be allowed to allowed to speak. We're usually often the ones, along with other important partners, who are defending NGOs so they're not excluded because they're controversial. That some countries do try to exclude NGOs because they are forthright. We say that their voices should be heard. We often try to encourage multi-stakeholder meetings, and we also try to, to talk about are there ways to make the um, the discussions of the Human Rights Council more visible. Obviously, there it, it, it's public, but not everyone can get, get to Geneva. It's expensive to get to Geneva. It's a long way. Um, and so one of the things we, we tried to do, just, just, just said, and, there, and you know, many different countries are trying to grapple with this, but when we had our own UPR, um, we actually then actually had a session afterwards, um, also in the Palais, with non-governmental organizations. And while US organizations came to, to then question their governments, that is, you should be able to question your own government. Um, but we also said we had a web link because it obviously lots of lots of NGOs and NGOs were going to fly to Geneva, and so we actually had a web link so you could actually we had them gather at the Department of Washington State so that you could ask questions. Maybe there's some scope for uh, the use of technology um, to uh, allow um, voices from at home to be part of the UPR process. There might be some, some creative uh, ways to, to address address those issues as well. And we're conscious that, uh, that there are 40 countries that are members, at least 40 countries that are members of the UN and New York that aren't in Geneva because it's so expensive to be there. We think that's actually a dis disadvantage. You know, all voices should be part of the debate, debates about whether it's human rights, humanitarian response, and other issues that are on the agenda in, in the uh, UN uh, Geneva. Um, and then um, we uh, asked me a question about the Indian Ocean. Now again, that's a much larger question, so I, again, I'm apologizing, we're not really, really addressing, the, addressing the whole issue. Obviously, we're both long-standing supporters of freedom of the seas issues and access uh, for, for all through, uh, through, uh, through international uh, waters. I think that we need to be able to, to do that. You asked me just to pick up one of the different questions was particularly about Burma. And obviously, if you think about, again, in the time of world historical changes over the past few years, which is just remarkable in and of itself, just looking at the evolution uh, and Burma thing is particularly uh, particularly important. We've uh, both, in our own national capacities, have been looking at um, or recalibrating both our support for our, for Burma. Obviously, our secretary made a, his historic trip as part of that. And our national response to the changes in Burma. We also, as a member of the United Nations and uh, the executive board of the UN Development Program, have uh, then also changed our approach and been supportive of greater and appropriate engagement by the development aid, UN development agencies in Burma. We've, been, we've looked at some of the programs we think that we, we, that we, think we should support. We also think it's important that we continue to watch on that, probably on an annual basis, to review what's going on to make sure that the progress being made is commensurate uh, with what we would expect and would still continue to merit uh, 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 expanding expansion of UN programs in that area. But we're trying to at least also to look at how we uh, sort of update uh, our approach, but we also think we have to continue to uh, to, uh, to observe what's, what's going on as part of this one. Again, I'm sorry, a short answer to a, to a, to a much larger question. Yeah. Well, before I draw proceedings to a close and invite you all to uh, partake in refreshments outside, uh, I'd just like to say it's been a, such a pleasure to host you, Assistant Secretary. Yeah. Uh, normally, very important people who come to speak speak to a prepared script, and that's about all you get, and you rarely get the chance to ask questions. But today, you've spent more than half your time, I think, taking questions from the floor and responding to the interests of the people in the room, and that, that, that is uh, it's so generous of you, and it's a testament to the depth and strength of your own uh, personal knowledge and experience, and the way you bring together the policy and practitioner world and the academic world. So, 
uh, on behalf of everyone in this room and the, the broader ANU community, thank you so much for coming and visiting us and sharing your, your insights. Thank you.